So hi everyone, today we're going to do a talk on malignant or necrotizing of titus externa as part of our A to Z in ENT teaching series. My name's Tom, I'm one of the Heads and Neck Junior Clinical Fellows working at UCLH at the moment. So in terms of what we're going to talk about, we'll talk about what malignant or necrotizing of titus externa is, some of the causes and risk factors the pathophysiology, some of the complications that can come about from it, what to look for in your history and examination of patients presenting with this, some of the investigations involved, other differential diagnoses to consider and treatment. So despite the, the name malignant otitis externa, it's not in fact a malignancy, but can behave like one, hence the name. So more commonly referred to as necrotizing otitis externa nowadays for that reason. Uh, other terms you may hear for it include skull-based osteomyelitis. So in terms of what it is, uh, it's a complication of acute otitis externa resulting in osteomyelitis of the external auditory canal and the surrounding skull base. Was first reported in 1938 and described in more detail by Chandler and colleagues in 1968. We'll uh, talk about his criteria a little bit later on in the, in the talk. Uh, it can have very severe consequences. Essentially, it can start to knock off your cranial nerves and result in, in death, which is why it's a significant disease. And needs to be treated urgently. In terms of causes, so most commonly it's a bacterial organism with Pseudomonas being by far the most common. Uh, there are various other types of bacteria that can cause malignant otitis externa. Some examples here on the screen are Proteus, Klebsiella and Staphylococcus as well. Uh, however, the second most frequent cause of necrotizing otitis externa would be fungal in origin, with aspergillus being the, being the most common fungal form. And we'll talk about what kind of things you're looking for in examination to help you differentiate between the two a bit later on. Um, so in terms of risk factors and who's most likely to, to get necrotizing otitis externa, by far the most common risk factor would be be being immunosuppressed or, or diabetic. So this is this is something we always want to look for with patients that we're considering might have this. Uh, also, those on that have HIV or are on chemotherapy. So even in your younger patients, it's that's something to consider if they have these these risk factors. Uh, it is more common in the elderly population. And other risk factors involved would be your general risk factors for acute otitis externa. So um, causing trauma to the ear canal using cotton buds. It's often referred to as swimmer's ear, so having a wet ear canal or humidity. And we'll talk a bit later on about some of the other things you would ask in the history. So in terms of the pathophysiology, so as I've mentioned, it starts with an acute infection of the external auditory canal that then spreads to bony erosion in the canal and in the skull base and into the surrounding tissue. As demonstrated in the picture in the bottom right hand corner, in the external auditory canal, we have several small gaps in the temporal bone known as the fissures of Santorini. And it's via spread through these fissures that the disease spreads into the temporal bone, could begin e bony erosions. Uh, it can then invade the stylomastoid foramen and the jugular foramen to start involving the cranial nerves, most notably the facial nerve, cranial nerves 9, 10 and 11. It can rarely involve the hypoglossal nerve too. Uh, Subtemporal spread through the osteocartilaginous junction can also lead to spread to the parapharyngeal space, the TMJ, and to the masticator spaces. 
rarely can also lead to intracranial complications, including sigmoid sinus thrombosis uh, to the jugular vein and also erosion towards the carotid artery too. And spread of infection leading to cerebral abscess or, or meningitis. So there's some very severe complications that can result from this, this disease process. The mortality used to be much higher before, before the modern day treatments it used to be in the region of about 50%. It's a bit better now. Uh, so I've already touched on some of the complications. So it, involvement of cranial nerves, seven, nine, 10, 11, and sometimes 12 as well. Uh, so as shown in the image below, so on the right hand side, we've got a facial nerve palsy on the right side of the face, no forehead sparing, hence it's lower motor neurone, it's a complete ipsilateral paralysis of the facial nerve. Uh, also touched on some of the intracranial complications that can arise from necrotizing otitis externa, can have spread of infection causing meningitis or possible thrombos thrombosis or a cerebral abscess. Other complications might include recurrence of disease and, um, and mortality. So mortality is now in the region of 10 to 20%. It's still a significant number, but it is better than that 50% previously described. Things to look for in your history when you, you're seeing patients on the ward or in your, your treatment room clinic. So the main things that would point you towards a diagnosis of, of this are being non-responsive to initial therapy. So patients that are coming back in their second or third week, treatment of otitis external, and it's just not getting better. They've had several weeks, several courses of topical therapy with antibiotic and steroid drops. If the pain is out of proportion to the symptoms and, um, and the clinical findings. However, I have, I have seen patients with confirmed necrotizing otitis externa that have tolerated the pain very well too and really not been in that much discomfort. So, so it's all relative. Night pain is a characteristic symptom for, for ne necrotizing otitis externa. Is the pain keeping them awake at night? Uh, they're likely to present with ongoing discharge in the ear, similar to an acute otitis externa, and similarly with hearing loss too, can have a conductive hearing loss. Uh, other risk factors, as mentioned, so being immunocompromised and diabetic, start to ring some alarm bells and make you think, could this, could this be NOE? Uh, and as mentioned previously, use of cotton buds causing trauma to the ear canal and swimmer's ear too. So this on the left-hand side is a table showing Cohen, Cohen's um, criteria published back in 1967. And this can also be a very helpful indicator for what kind of things you should be thinking of with regards to a diagnosis of NOE. So the major signs include pain, discharge, exudate, edema, and stenosis of the canal. You can see all three of those just with acute otitis externa though. Granulation tissue in the ear canal, that should start ringing alarm bells about wh whether this could be in more bony erosion and, and a more significant disease process, make it, making us think about NOE. Uh, a techni positive technetium scan. So we'll talk about the imaging involved a bit later on. Uh, and some of the minor signs, pseudomonas, after we've sent a bacterial swab off, it's come back as that. However, also the most common cause of acute otitis externa. We don't really use radiographs nowadays. Uh, diabetes being one of the common risk factors and um, old age, as, as mentioned previously. So in terms of your examination of these patients, so a thorough neurological and cranial nerve exam is, is very important. As mentioned, some of the complications with this disease process can be knocking off your cranial nerves. So to do a thorough examination here, including a neurological examination, since intracranial complications can also, can also be seen with this disease process. 
then you're going to want to move on to a more focused examination of the ear itself. So start by looking at the ear externally. Is there any soft tissue swelling pre auriculis post auriculi Is there any developing cellulitis of the ear? As, a, as shown in this top left picture here, some uh, pinna cellulitis. Uh, and then, then you, we're gonna want to have a look in the ear. So first of all, touch the ear is, is exquisitely painful when pulling on the pinna or pressing on the tragus. However, you can also get these signs in acutus arsis externa too. Uh, in terms of otoscopy, most commonly you are gonna want to have a look with a microscope as this you're gonna, gonna want to do some microsuction too. You may well see some canal stenosis or edema. It's not, in, not uncommon that the entire canal may be blocked off. You might not be able to see the tympanic membrane. You may have to put a Pope wick in. But uh, as some of the pictures have shown here, so the third picture, along, show some granulation tissue on the left side of that image. So that's highly suspicious for, for necrotizing otitis externa. Second picture here is showing edema and stenosis of the canal with some discharge. You can't see all the way through to the tympanic membrane. Uh, the canal is likely to be exquisitely sensitive when microsuctioning. However, that can also be exhibited in just acute otitis externa too. This bottom left picture here shows a more fungal type picture with the black, black spore-like findings on otoscopy. Okay. So in terms of the, some of the investigations you're going to want to send off when considering a diagnosis of NOE. <clears throat> so bloods, first of all. So what, what we wouldn't routinely take bloods from a patient with acute otitis externa, but once we're considering this diagnosis, you're likely going to want to admit the patient for further investigation. So send off some bloods, particularly inflammatory markers. So um, full blood count, looking at white cells, CRP, and then an ESR, so more long-term marker of chronic inflammation. Also check the renal function because some of the medications and antibiotics that we use to treat NOE can impact upon renal function, so it's particularly relevant, and also some of the imaging involved, particularly CT scanning. Going to want to know what the GFR is. And to check glucose too, with diabetes being one of the most common risk factors. <clears throat> Sending off an ear swab, very important. It will tell us what microorganisms are growing in the ear, uh, it may be able to differentiate between fungal or bacterial too, so it will guide the antibiotic therapy that we'll use. So the only way to differentiate between necrotizing otitis externa and SCC is to take a biopsy. So a biopsy should always be taken if there's any granulation tissue or, or any, any mass visible in the ear. And this picture on the right-hand sh side shows shows an SCC of the external ear canal, which can present similarly to what looks like bony erosion. So sending a biopsy is imperative as well. In terms of imaging modalities, it can start, start to get a bit more complex and this does tend to vary between trusts. There isn't a uniform protocol here. Uh, not all trusts utilise nuclear imaging scanning nowadays, but there still are a handful utilising them. Uh, latest meta-analysis in the laryngoscope actually recommends against using them, but as I say, some trusts are still using them, so it's uh, good to be aware of these. Uh, the most frequent first-line investigation will be a CT petrous temporal bone. Uh, some trusts also use MRI to better delineate soft tissue swelling and disease, but it's not usually first line. Uh, and then moving on to the nuclear imaging modalities, for technetium and gallium scanning. So technetium scanning works by assessing osteoblastic activity, and it tends to be useful for initial evaluation of disease. 
However, it's not useful for assessing progress. There's a tendency to re remain positive even after the resolution of the disease. So um, it can be helpful in picking up necrotizing hepatitis externa, but, but only, for, only for diagnosis, not for resolution of disease. And it can also be positive for just simple hepatitis externa too, or malignancy, hence the importance of taking that biopsy. But um, it can be useful in picking up patients that might have NOE that have had a negative CT scan, which is why some trusts are still using it. The gallium scanning, uh, this is more useful for assessing resolution of disease. And uh, it will show increased uptake in areas of affected disease. And it's uh, the bottom right scan is a, an example of a gallium, gallium Im imaging. Uh, it tends to bind to rapidly dividing cells, including inflammatory cells and tumor cells. So similarly, it can, can also show increased uptake with tumors too. Um, there's been a lot of debate as to the utility of these scans. Some papers have been published showing that the gallium scan will remain positive in up, up to 50% of patients. However, a clinical examination of, of the ears is not, not shown ongoing disease and their treatment was terminated and they didn't come back. So um, hence why the laryngoscopes rec recommending that it's not, not actually that useful, but it's good to be aware of it and your trust may well use it. In terms of management, so the mainstay is going to be long-term antibiotic therapy, both, both topical with antibiotic and steroid ear drops and uh, long-term intravenous antibiotics. This will vary depending on the trust that you work in. Uh, hence, discussions with microbiology will be important. Usually going to be anti-pseudomonal, but just be guided by the, the cultures that you, you've had. So I think my trust was using IV intravenous keftriaxone and also oral ciprofloxacin, giving anti-pseudomonal cover. Um, it's not necessary nowadays for patients to remain in hospital for the entire course. Hence this picture here showing a PIC line inserted for long-term antibiotics. And then the patient can go home with this in and have, have nursing input in the community, usually twice, twice daily antibiotics. Uh, they will require meg regular microsuction. So they may well be booked into a treatment room clinic once a week or, or more frequently. Type glycemic control, with diabetes being one of, one of the main risk factors. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So not all trusts offer this. In fact, it's very, very few. Uh, and there have been some studies showing no additional benefit, but it, it's in some of the literature. So it's, it's worth mentioning. And then these patients will require long-term follow-up since there is a risk of recurrence and they, they need to be reviewed in clinic, usually by a registrar or consultant. And also having a pure tone or audiogram since it can affect hearing and affect the cranial nerves. And evasion, invasion into the surrounding ear structures. That's some of the references. Uh, thank you very much. I will attach a, a survey monkey link below. Be grateful for any feedback.